The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Today, Cassandra Steptoe has an appointment with her team at the Women's HIV Program at the University of California, San Francisco. So you had labs in about the middle of July, mm -hmm. and so I have your results, and your results from those lab tests are your T-cells right now are 1,023. Um, excuse me, your T-cells right now are 1,120, and your virus is undetectable. Oh my gosh, that's great. In the late 1980s and early 90s, HIV infection was a virtual death sentence. But now, thanks to a combination of powerful drugs that made their appearance in the mid-90s, the AIDS epidemic in the United States has changed dramatically. The death rates immediately after 1995 plummeted. The uh, transmission rates from a mother to a child uh, in the United States have almost been eliminated. If you have access to the antiretroviral medicines, you do have the opportunity to get healthy and survive and may have the opportunity to lead a normal lifespan. In the 15 years since the peak of the epidemic, the number of AIDS deaths in the United States has fallen by 70%, but not among poor African-American men and women. HIV is now the leading cause of death for African-American women between 24 and 35 years old. A, a black woman is 23 times more likely to get infected with HIV than a white woman. With the highest AIDS rate of any large U.S. city, Washington, D.C. offers a stark example of the causes of this health crisis. Today, D.C.'s AIDS rate is close to what San Francisco's was in 1996, and although African Americans make up only half of D.C.'s population, they suffer 86 percent of the city's AIDS cases. It's really a reflection of poverty and poor health care services available in that city, um, commonness of drug use, limits on education, just resource allocation. The prevalence of HIV in residents of Washington, D.C. is comparable to some areas in Sub-Saharan Africa. It is, in fact, in Sub-Saharan Africa that AIDS continues to take its biggest toll. While in the United States in 2007, 14,000 people died of AIDS, in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 1.6 million people died of AIDS that same year. But these alarming statistics actually represent a small improvement. Since 2002, the U.S. and other governments and private donors like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have channeled $7 billion to send drugs to Africa and to improve their delivery. Essentially, uh, at the turn of the century, only about 1 to 2 percent of Africans living in sub-Saharan Africa who needed antiretroviral therapy were able to access therapy. Now we see that uh, approximately one out of every four Africans who need uh, therapy are receiving it. That's the good news. The bad news is still three out of four are not receiving therapies. Despite millions of dollars invested in creating a vaccine against HIV, efforts have so far failed. An HIV vaccine is clearly the holy grail of the field. Unfortunately, progress has been haltingly slow. And the reason, of course, is that this virus, uh, as soon as one mounts an immune response against this virus, it has the ability to mutate and change. Zidovudine, stavudine, emtricitabine, didanacine. So for now, aside from prevention, the only weapons we have against the virus are 23 different medications. When used in combination, these drugs can reduce the amount of virus to undetectable levels. These different drugs attack the virus at different points in its life cycle. From the moment HIV binds to its first cell until it emerges from this infected cell and prepares to attack the next one. What happened when you missed that dose way back then, two years ago? It's because, you know, um, I forgot and I had to hurry off to school. We've come a long way with HIV therapy, but there are definitely hurdles that we still have to cross. One of the big hurdles we have to cross is resistance to the HIV medications. As people 
tend to be human and not take their medications regularly, this gives the virus a chance to form mutations and limits the pool of treatment options that we have. This is why developments of new HIV medications are so crucial. Helping patients stick to their regimens, adhere to them as close as possible, can help preserve what we have until someday when we have a cure for HIV. In the search for new anti-HIV drugs, researcher Mario Santiago found inspiration in chimpanzees. As a doctoral student at the University of Alabama, he helped figure out that HIV originated in chimpanzees on the border between Cameroon and Congo in Western Africa. But one more fact intrigued him. One of the things that fascinated me when we were doing this study is that a lot of these chimps um, have been infected with the vi virus for a long period of time and they seem to be surviving pretty well. The question of how the chimps' immune system could keep the virus at bay brought Santiago to San Francisco's Gladstone Institute, a research center affiliated with UC San Francisco. Here, Warner Green has been studying a lesser known part of the immune system called the innate immune system. The innate immune system acts within hours uh, within minutes to hours of infection by a pathogen. It is the first line of defense, the shock troops that are right there at the ready. These shock troops enter into action before we even start producing antibodies. The innate system is on its own for a while until troops from the adaptive immune system are ultimately rallied and then come in with precise weapons to attack the pathogens. Among the innate system's initial defenses is a protein called APOBEC, or A3G for short. If given the chance, A3G can actually destroy HIV. But it never does get the chance, because HIV uses one of its own nine proteins, called VIF, to destroy A3G. So treatment based on A3G well, will be dependent on finding an antagonist between the interaction between A3G and uh, VIF and it will act at the late stage of uh, the virus life cycle, and, and that differentiates it from all the other drugs that are out in the market right now. If VIF weren't present, A3G would eliminate the HIV virus after it infected its first cell and entered a new one. I think most in the field regard this as the most exciting current target for anti-HIV drug development. So unlike the existing 23 anti-HIV drugs, a new one based on A3G would simply clear the way for our own body's immune system to eliminate the virus. In the lab, Santiago is searching for different mutants of A3G that seem to stand up to HIV's VIF. So, so you see that in the presence of VIF, this mutant doesn't get degraded as much also. So if we could potentially get our immune system to get rid of HIV, why couldn't we cure HIV infection? Well, because some of the wily virus actually hides inside a patient's cells and strikes again if the patient stops taking their medication. Scientists call this ability to lie dormant and reappear latency. HIV, in addition to replicating and spreading within CD4 T cells, it establishes a latent reservoir, a sleeping store of virus. And so the idea here is to use agents to activate all of those cells all at once. And maybe we can reduce that from a million cells to say five cells. And maybe five cells, maybe the immune system can take care of that. Maybe the immune system can keep things in check or control which means that maybe we could get rid of the antiretroviral therapy, which would be huge. They would avoid the toxicities, the costs would be lower. I mean, for society, that would be a, a tremendous uh, gain. At a Stanford University lab, chemists are designing a compound that could rouse the latent virus from its slumber. Their original inspiration came from a compound called prostratin, which traditional Samoan healers find in the bark of a tree and use to treat certain conditions like hepatitis. Nature is, is producing these natural products that have wonderful biological activity. They're wonderful stories. Nature is, is you know, just a, a tremendous teacher. Here we have prostratin in the middle. 
Now researchers are tinkering with prostratin to see how they can transform it into a compound even more effective at rousing the dormant HIV. The idea would be to use a powerful cousin of prostratin to wake the one million latent viruses hidden in a patient's cells, then swiftly kill them off with anti-HIV drugs. The process would be faster and less expensive than lifelong anti-HIV therapy. The possibility of ridding the body entirely of HIV opens the door to a day when the virus doesn't carry the stigma it does today. Oh, I'm so happy about you getting married. That's so exciting. Yeah. So that's something big because being HIV positive, I never thought that I would get a partner because of my status. All right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Eddie and Jennifer. Thanks a lot. Cure would be uh, glorious. It would transform everyone's lives. There wouldn't be a sexually transmitted disease called AIDS. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Keep Quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org slash quest.